Hey guys, what's up? This is Casey, this is Coach Tom, this is Shot Science Overtime number 49, I believe. So the way that this is going to work, the way that this is going to work out is that uh, we're going to take questions from you guys, so if you want to start sending us your questions, send them to at Shot Science on Twitter, or you can send them to us in the chat, which we try to get to all of those, or you can send them to us on Facebook and Google+. Um, and we try to get through all of those as well. Best place is always Twitter, though, so make sure you send it to us there. Um, let's see, also make sure you're subscribed to us on Shot Science because that's where we post all of our videos and tutorials and stuff like that. And also, uh, we're trying out a new microphone, so let us know if uh, we sound better this week. And if you can, it would be great if you guys could go out, tell your friends, family, whoever, post on your Facebook page, tell them to come to the live show because it will help us bring in cool guests to talk to you guys. So uh, if you could go out and spread the word a little bit, that would be awesome. And uh, before we get into taking questions, we already have a few. Um, we want to talk to you guys quickly about uh, driving to the basket or as opposed to shooting to the basket and kind of reading the defense and what you need to do to kind of figure out what the best uh, kind of way to approach that is. So if you want to take that on a little bit, why don't, sure. we, why don't we break it up? So we'll, we'll talk about... <clears throat> closely guarded and maybe playing off a little bit and, and kind of how to deal with that. <clears throat> I've got kind of a little frog in my throat this morning. <clears throat> One of the things that we think is really important if you're being uh, crowded by a defender is that uh, you have to then take and attack that person, put the ball on the floor. And you need to have some uh, uh, skills to be able to do that. You can't just necessarily just step by them. But one of the things that's really important is to understand that the distance between them and you uh, is something that you need to be able to read and make a determination, is this person likely to contest my shot? Or are they close enough that I want to attack them off the dribble? And as you get better with the game, you're going to find out that this decision comes a lot easier for you. And we have a, a, a saying that we kind of teach everybody that we work with, and that is, if the defender crowds you, in other words, they are up into your space, and that space sometimes differs with people, uh, different players, but if they are up close to you and they are contesting that shot, they've got the hand up in your face, they are prime for you to attack them off the dribble. And the reason for that is that they have very little time to react uh, to your attack. And if you couple that with the way you attack, then that makes it way more effective for you. For example, let's say that uh, you want to use the long one-on-one -on -one attack every time you attack that basket. And the long one-on-one -on -one is explained and demonstrated for you in our video by that title. And so I would go there and check that out. You have to be able to attack the person both the right and the left side effectively um, because if they get on, you're only a right-handed uh, uh, dribbler or driver or whatnot, they get on your right hand and now you're left with something maybe you're not very effective at using your left hand. So you want to be able to drive the ball either right or left side. And the other thing too is that if you think about it, the reason why you want to take them immediately if they're crowding you is because you're the person that's in the position of control yes. because you have the basketball. They have to adapt to what you do. Right. And so if you have the ball in your hands, you're the, you should make them have to make a decision on what to do after that. Exactly. And if they have to take a second to do that, you should be by them. So if you have one step and you can beat them with one step, they're going to have a hard time catching up with you. So right. you should immediately go as soon as they get up on you. Right. And there's several other things that you can use to do that. Uh, one of the things you can use is the jab step. Uh, and you can see our video on the jab step, which kind of helps you to set them up for the attack, either one way or the other. Well, it keeps them <clears> honest, <throat> or yep. if, they're, if they're not being honest with you, then you can go right by them yep. or, or uh, pull it for the shot. Right. One of the other things is what is called the uh, rip and go. And that is when you find that they are con constantly in your uh, face or trying to get into the passing lane to deflect the pass. Uh, you catch that ball and rip it under your knees and go. There's no hesitation. You just absolutely go right away. And they have very little time to react to that, and so that makes you an effective player there. Now, looking at this thing from the other side is, well, when should I shoot? Um, in our game yesterday, we have a couple of guys who can shoot the ball pretty good, but they were uh, not shooting the ball when they were open. And there's a couple of reasons why. Number one, we don't like to shoot early in the, in the shot clock. We'd like to take and, and wind it down a little bit, and usually you get better looks after you have worked the ball from one side of the floor to the other. And so by moving the ball around and, and maybe getting a skip pass, then we're going to get better looks. But 
both these young men had an opportunity to shoot the ball uh, several times and didn't shoot it because they were afraid that that person who was closing on them was going to take and block the shot. Well, um, from my vantage point, uh, it looked like they had shots and they just did not take them. So they have, to, and one, that's one of the things that we spend time on is, look, you know, you have to get a feel for where that guy is and what he's doing, and if you feel like you've got an open shot, go for it. And if he blocks one, oh, okay, that happens. And then uh, the next time you give him that little same fake, and he's looking to get it again, and now you uh, you just turn and go right by him. So uh, understanding how to play that uh, situation is real important for for players on all levels, not just high school or grade school or whatnot, college professionals, all the same program. Pretty yeah. Much. Okay. So let's let's break it down. <laughs> Super simple. If a guy is crowding you, you do what? Uh, they crowd. I go. If a guy is playing off of you. Uh, they lay back, I'm going to fire. If I've got the ability to shoot the ball, I'm going to shoot it. If they're playing uh, kind of hedging a little bit on both, you got to kind of do something where you're uh, baiting them. So well, something like jab step yeah, exactly or right. a, a shot fake or something yeah. like that. Test them a little bit, right. and then they're going to have to make a decision. And if they don't, then you can do one of the other. Right, right. And, you know, if there's ever any question in your mind about whether to do it or not, just reverse the ball. Um, go back to one of your teammates, and it'll come back to you a, a, another or, time. Or even pass fake. Pass fake is really Cause, important. Because you can get that guy to try to jump to the ball, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden he is out of position. You can drive by him or maybe even get a shot off or something. Too. Right. Or, or drop it in the post. Exactly right. We're really big on using pass fakes. And, and in, in the zone uh, versus a zone defense, one of the things that we teach uh, all of our players that they have the ball above their head so that they can make those effective pass fakes. And once in a while you pull it down and make a low fake, but keeping the ball above your head and, and working the ball from side to side also and skipping the ball across the court to the opposite side. It's a much better situation if the ball is high. One of the things that happens to us is that when we get the ball down around our shoulders and midsection, it's really difficult for us, almost impossible for us to skip the ball from one side to the other. We happen to have a group of uh, players that uh, for the, about probably the last five years, we spent an awful lot of time on skipping the ball from one side to the other. And the reason we do that is that um, we're really trying to force the defense into having to make uh, very uh, uh, fast closeouts. And when they have to make fast closeouts, one of the things that happens, either we get maybe a good look or they're coming at us so strong we can up fake and then step right by them. So, uh, that's all real important to consider as well. And the other thing, too, is that if you watch a team like, let's say, the Spurs, yep. and when they're playing, they are constantly reversing the ball, getting penetration and kicking it out, yep. and trying to get the defense out of position and off balance, and they do that through moving the ball and getting those little penetrations and, and drawing the defense in and having the defense have to move in ways that they don't necessarily want to. Yeah, exactly. And when you do that, you start to create openings, and, uh, you know, that's kind of the, the secondary part, I guess, of, of what we were talking about after reading the defense individually is kind of like as a, as a whole, I guess, kind of reading the defense. Right, right. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we find in, in playing the level of basketball that we do is that there are some teams who their help side defense really never gets any further uh, toward the basketball than maybe the their near uh, lane line. And... We like to get our players to the split line, which is that uh, invisible line that goes from basket to basket. We like to have our help side defense there. And one of the things that happens is this, is that um, it's really difficult to drive against those teams because there's so many people in the middle. And we like to discourage that middle penetration. One of the things we also like to discourage is we don't like to have somebody on the wings uh, be able to come over the top and get into the paint, and yet it happens to us. So that's something that we need to really work on. But um, examining what is happening on the defense is real important. Oftentimes, players will want to stretch a little bit because they're afraid to get too far away from their man. And uh, when they do that, well, then we know that we're going to be able to get into the lane and okay. uh, hopefully do a good job there. Yeah. Okay. So hopefully the takeaway there is they crowd, I, I go. go. If they lay off, you pop. If they're playing middle, you got to uh, figure out uh, what what kind of tool to use: exactly. jab, step, pump fake, whatever. Yeah. And in a team setting, <laughs> moving the ball, reversing the ball, getting penetration, and kicking it out. Those are other great ways to create space and get openings for open looks and open shots. Right. Right.
Okay, so let's move on. Question right. question time. All right. Um, okay, so I wanted to remind you guys that if you want your question answered, best place is to hit us on Twitter. We are at Shot Science there. You can ask us in the Q&A app on Google+. I guess that's one of the new things they have lined up, and we'll try that one. Um, you can also hit us on Google+, and on Facebook, on Shot Science Facebook, and also in the chat. And we'll try to get to as many of the chat questions as we possibly can and subscribe to YouTube. Um, okay, so the first question that we're getting here is from uh, Coach Craig McHugh, who is at Real Craig McHugh. Uh, he asked some questions last week. He said, any ideas for drills to stop players from picking up their dribble uh, before they're ready to pass or shoot and getting trapped? Hmm. Well, Coach, I don't know that there's necessarily drills that you could actually use. I'm sure you could devise something, but just the constant reminder of the fact that they keep that dribble alive is real important. And, you know, young players, uh, I find, oftentimes have difficulty in knowing exactly when they can terminate that dribble and when they need to keep it going. And so I think just a verbal reminder of that probably helps an awful lot. Uh, we have one, of the, one young man on our team who dribbles too much. Uh, he's an effective player. He can get to the basket, but uh, once he gets the ball in his hands, he doesn't have a good sense about what to do when things break down. And uh, he'll often often get into traffic and, and uh, have difficulty getting rid of the basketball. Well, I mean, here's what you could do. You could set up a scenario where you're going to send the ball carrier into the corner or into a place where when you pick up the ball, bad things happen, and then send two guys in to there to trap him. him. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's I, we used to run stuff like that too. Is you just set up the scenario, and then uh, you know that guy has to kind of figure it out. But you know, I think just reminding everybody on your team of the reasons why not to do things, yeah. and giving them a logistical reason to avoid certain situations, such such as uh, you know going to the corners for any reason is a bad idea because you're creating at least one to two new defenders by uh, being up against those those lines, uh, the out-of-bounds line and the half-court line, um, and then the trap comes and then you got nowhere to go. Uh, staying away from the sidelines when you're bringing the ball up the court yep. and just generally picking the ball up uh, before you're ready to pass, which you already said. A lot of that comes just from experience and knowing what the consequences are. Well, another part of that whole thing, too, is this, is that often players take the ball on the dribble too deep into a, con a, a converging double team, and then they're caught, and they, have to pick the, they feel like they have to pick the dribble up. One of the th things that we teach our students and players is this, is that when you are feeling the pressure from either one or two players, that you learn how to retreat, dribble, and attack. And we, that's what we refer to this drill as, attack, retreat, attack. And uh, we have a video on that, I think, don't we, Casey? Yeah, it's one of the dribble attacks. Yeah, and, and the thing that happens there is that when you use that escape dribble where you're working away from them and they are converging on you, uh, trying to trap you, then it's easy to attack one defender or the other and typically go by them. And it's it's... One of the things that we teach, and we think it's pretty sound too, is this, is that keep the ball in the middle of the floor as much as possible because to avoid the boundaries that Casey was talking about a while ago. And when you get caught in a double team and they're really converging on your feeling pressure, use the attack, retreat, attack, and attack one defender, and we recommend that you attack the defender who is toward the middle of the floor. That way, if you they can't drive you over the sideline and... Uh, trap you there and use the sideline as a as another defender. That's what that's what I was gonna say. I was it was that if they're charging at you, even even if you don't do the retreat uh, yep. attack retreat attack attack one guy. Yep. Don't pick up the ball and and choke it, and also don't try to gun it up the middle. It's good to pick one guy, go at that guy because then he's gonna have to stop short, and the other guy's gonna have to compensate. And uh, you know you gotta kind of push the the issue. Don't let them set up. The, the, uh, the control for that situation. Well, well, one of the things that happens is that when I attack the, the one defender to the inside of the floor, then he typically will screen off his, his, his own teammate to create any kind of a double team. And so it's impossible for the, them to double team you anymore. When you attack them, you just go and continue going. And, and if they're trying to double team you and you're moving, that's a lot harder than if you pick up the ball and you're oh, yeah. just sitting duck waiting yeah. for them to show up. Right. Um, so you know if if you tell your guy to push it when especially when he sees that trap, I mean that's a good idea. Yeah. 
Yeah. One of the other things that's real important uh, versus uh, trapping defenses is we always try to keep the inbounder uh, behind the basketball so that we can always reverse the ball backwards uh, and then whip it around to the other side of the court. And that keeps us kind of out of trouble, too. And uh, if the person does pick up the dribble and they kind of got him cornered, then that uh, person who inbounded the basketball can come a little bit more in behind him and he can reverse that. He's got an escape for that pass. Yes. So those are things, hopefully, that would help you, Coach, uh, uh, with answering those questions, hopefully. If yeah. not, get back to us again. Yeah, I mean, there's not really drills. You'd have to set up the scenarios. Situations, yeah. And, and uh, you know, I think the best thing is to equip them with uh, the consequences of, of the, what they what would happen if they do certain things. Well, the other thing that I think is real important, and I'm kind of a nitpicker about a lot of things, but one of the things that I think happens is that when it when something like that occurs, you stop practice and you spend maybe a half a minute or so explaining why that can't work, why you must not do that, and then every time that happens again, you stop practice. Pretty soon, everybody get, begins to tune in on what you're saying to this one person. And maybe they're not in that situation very often, but at least they have that in their mind uh, if it should happen to them as well. Yeah, okay. And here's a quick thing, too, is that when you're working with kids or players or whoever, it's good to teach them the reasons why to do things, yep. not just to drill people. Yep. Because, I mean, you can drill people and maybe they kind of respond the way that you want them to in most situations, but if you tell them why and you give them reasons for doing things, then they can kind of make that... Mm -hmm decision intuitively without having to, uh, you know, go through all these drills and things like that. Right. Well, that that is a great point, and one that kind of uh, is the basis for all of our teaching is, and anything that we do with basketball, probably is in the classroom when I used to be there as well, but the idea is, okay, this happens, and I want you to do this, and then explaining why it's important to do it that way, then they get a greater understanding of what they need to do. And one of the things that's so important in, in this basketball, in a game of basketball, and others as well, is when you begin to understand it, then what you find is that your this understanding um, what is the word that I use all the time that I can't think of right now? Uh, it creates a real understanding um, of the game. Uh, the name has escaped me. I'll Aptitude. remember it. Aptitude for the game. Aptitude really is a, a word that you don't hear used very much uh, anymore, but when I was a young guy and coaching and teaching and whatnot, uh, aptitude meant um, recognition of a particular situation and then moving to make a decision on what you're going to do to deal with that. Uh, and that's real important in the game of basketball because you have to recognize and you have to dig deep into your uh, uh, memory bank to decide, okay, what am I going to do here? And pretty soon it becomes to the point where you don't have to think about it very much because it's very intuitive for you. So uh, aptitude for the game, you build that when you tell them why uh, you want them to do this. Yeah, and great coaches tend to do that kind yep. of thing. It's, yep, they do. They, you know, they don't want their automaton players out there just <laughs> doing, you know, making kind of going through the robotic moves. I mean, well, and making the same mistakes over and over and over and over yep. again. Yeah. Okay, cool. Next question is from Ryan Dumoulin, who says, uh, who is at ryguy131 on Twitter. He says, how would you attack a 2-3 zone defense? Oh, gosh. You know, um, that's interesting thought. Let's do some quick answers. Uh, well, we hang on for a second. One of the things that happens when we talk about team offense and team defense is that it is is such a wide scope. Um, there are some people who uh, design plays that you use against the zone, and some of those can be really effective. One of the things that I can remember from 100 years ago when I was coaching as a young guy is that the basic rule in basketball is you never, you never uh, uh, screened against a zone. And, well, I didn't believe that, and so I screened against a zone, and we were pretty successful with it. Now, you take and watch teams who are working against the zones, um, particularly teams like Syracuse, who is an outstanding zone team, uh, you find people screening them all the time because that's going to create openings for shots for you. Uh, so uh, screening might be one thing you can use. There was a, a list that we put together about five years ago with a coaching friend of mine, and we used it on the teams that we were teaching, uh, that we were coaching at that time. And we used that as a basis for our, our offense. One of them was ball movement. You want to make sure that you move the ball from one side of the floor to the other. Every time the ball swings from uh, the 
uh, wing to the point to the opposite wing, that defense has to make two or three different slides. If it goes down to the baseline, and, and that was one of the rules. Anytime that we were going to move the basketball, we wanted to go baseline to baseline whenever possible. Swing it around the top, and that's so many slides that those defensive uh, people have to make that somebody is going to make a mistake in there, and uh, so that's kind of how we approach that. The other thing is you need to have somebody who is inside of uh, uh, the, the defense and they don't have to be standing there like a, a drugstore Indian or anything, but what they need to do is they need to be able to move inside that zone <coughs> and flash to the basketball. And <clears throat> what we mean that this is, this is a little uh, uh, study that we do with our, our guys every year, and, and that is we want to take and, and make sure that they understand that they are not going to trace the basketball. In other words, if the ball starts on the right wing, goes to the point, goes to the left wing, they don't just trace that. What they want to do is allow that basketball to get ahead so that they can flash into the middle, they can drop down and flash back up into the middle so that people can have a real difficulty in keeping track of them. One of the other things that those principles we use, when the ball went into the middle, we always, always, we're looking to shoot the basketball. And uh, what I see an awful lot of is this, is that the ball is thrown into the middle, and the person in the middle doesn't really know what to do with it, especially if they're not taught to shoot the basketball and they kick it right back out again. Well, you've just beat most of the defense by getting into the middle, so you want to look to shoot it. Okay, so those are a couple of thoughts. Here's another one or two, and that is you want to attack that defense in the seams. And that means the the uh, the seam is that uh, location, the, the opening between one player and the other. And when you can get into there uh, in, and aggressively get into there, and then when you get in, if you haven't got a, a a shot that you can get off right away, you jump stop, and then you can also take and kick the ball out to uh, other players of your own players who are at the perimeter. So those are just a couple of thoughts uh, that we think are real important in attacking a zone. Yeah, I was just going to say the thing that kills zones is is movement. And what they love in zones is if you just stand there or you try to do isolations yeah. and stuff like that because that's that's like what they're trying to do. They're just trying to block up the middle. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you're doing things like ball rotations, you're uh, penetrating and kicking it out, um, you're flashing in the post, you're just kind of dicing that up and you're moving around a bunch, uh, that's really going to create some opportunities, create some open space, um, and that's really the best way to go about it. Well, another thought that you can plug in there, too, that we think is really important, that is you can, uh, you can overload one side of the uh, defense. And one of the things that we use, and I'll just give a quick description, uh, the right wing passes the point, and when he passes the point, he makes a hard cut toward the baseline and comes out in the opposite corner. And when the ball is reversed to the opposite wing, now we have a little triangle in there between the uh, person on the baseline, the wing, and the post. And so usually we have one guy in the middle there. Who's he going to guard? Uh, he's going to guard, if he guards the, the wing, we give it to the guy on the baseline, and he's got to look. Um, and maybe he can even pop it into the post uh, uh, to get a shot there as well. If he lays off and is uh, helping to uh, maybe front the post, now both those guys got great looks at the basket. So overloading the defense. Um, uh, yeah, and, and like you were saying, like setting screens, yeah. doing kind of um, like the cuts and stuff like that. When you think about it, when a guy's, when they're playing zone defense, they're not marking a man. So if you're right. doing a lot of switches on, on where you're positioned and you're setting a screen, they have to have really good communication to really be able to adjust to that kind of stuff. Right. And if they're not doing that and you're going from one side of the court to the other or you're setting a screen and the guy is flashing, it's going to be hard for them to adjust. One more principle that, that I'll just throw out here on, on this uh, topic as well is it's always good to have a player who is playing on the baseline and he is playing behind the defense. In other words, it's really difficult for the defenders to keep track of that guy when he's moving from side to side behind them. They have to always be looking for him to find out where he is. And so that's an effective way as well. And that person can actually flash up into the middle, catch, and get a shot as well. All right. Hope this, those help you. Yeah, this is uh, from Michael Rolak, our regular guy, who is at Rolak Michael. He says, who is Trey Burke or Michael Carter-Williams? Those are two uh, rookie guys. Um, Michael Carter Williams is having like a really good year. I think he he had a his first game out. He he scored a bunch of points, set a record for like a rookie. 
Um, he's I think he had a triple double or something like that not that long ago. And uh, Trey Burke is a really great player too. I think yeah. he was a Michigan guy. Yeah. But uh, yeah, those are just two really great rookie players. Yeah. Okay, so send us your Twitter questions. Uh, we're going to go into the chat now and uh, hit up some of these questions. Um, this one is from Yakov Klugman, who says, how can I get confidence to drive or shoot? Well, you know, this is, this is probably the formula for playing this game and any other that you play, and that is you have to gain enough experience uh, yeah. and skill levels where you have confidence in what you can do, and then you try to do it. And here's, here's the thing that we always tell most everybody that we work with as well. This is a learning process, and the process is usually failure in the beginning. Failure meaning it didn't work, okay? Uh, and then you go again, you go again, you go again, and then you have one that does work, and you understand why that worked, and then it becomes a, a more success, success, failure, success, success. And, and your successes grow as your confidence and skill level grow. Yeah, I think, I think it's a really a two-part thing. It is getting the skill set up to the point where it performs. Yep. And then the other part is the mental aspect yep. where you, you do change your mind. You know that you're going to be successful, but you also accept that failures happen, but you're going to move on the next time. So, uh, you know, if you have those two kind of elements set up, that's where you really start to build confidence. But, I mean, there's no magic pill. There's uh, nothing that you can just flip on a switch on. I mean, that's you have to work on that kind of stuff. Well, yeah, and you know, one of the one of the analogies that I use quite often is what happened the first time you got on a bicycle? Well, you fell over. That's a failure. What happened the first time you got on a skateboard? You fell over. That's that's just the way it is because you have no confidence in yourself and being able to do it. After you've done it a bunch and you finally have that first success then, okay, okay, I, I think I can get this now. And uh, then this begins to build one upon the other, and that develops your confidence to try that. Okay, um, so we got a ton of questions in the chat. If you want your ch uh, question answered, shoot us a tweet. We are at Shot Science. But the next question is from Raw Fan, who says, is it bad to work out for a long time, like four hours? You know, I, I just don't think that that's really a good idea, four hours at a time. One of the things that I would uh, encourage anybody to do is this. If you want to work out for that long a period, uh, maybe take an hour and a half or two hours, uh, maybe early in the day if you can, and then another one later in the day because fatigue plays such a, a major factor in, in our learning process. As we get more exhausted, then our learning process really starts to break down quite a bit. And so uh, I would encourage you to take uh, shorter times if you want to take and still get the four hours. I mean, that's fine, but give yourself a break in between and try to practice in the morning if you can and practice in the afternoon. If it's such that you can only work in the afternoon, then work for two, two and a half hours. I suggest that you don't spend four hours. Well, here's, here's what I would say. I would say it's it's probably not good to do four hours of one thing. Nope. Um, I mean, maybe if playing a game might be all right, but I mean, if you're varying a workout out and you're doing you know an hour of shooting, then you're working on conditioning, and then you're doing some gameplay, and you're doing a bunch of different things. That's probably better. What happens eventually, though, is when you're doing four or five hours of anything, you kind of hit a mental and a physical fatigue wall. Yes, exactly. And when when you hit that, especially when you hit that mental fatigue wall, things really start to come apart. And then if you're practicing your shot and you're practicing all these uh, kind of uh, crappy mechanics, yeah. then when you come back the next day, those are the mechanics that you've you've kind of instilled yeah. in yourself. Yeah. So you want to make sure that you're if you're doing long workouts and you're having these periods of time and you're into it, you want to be into it too. If you're not into it, don't don't spend that much time. Right. But um, you're you're doing like these varied workouts where you're maybe working on different things and you're not going to have the mental breakdown because I know I can't go out there and shoot the same shot for four hours. Yeah. I have to do something different. That, well, you know, shooting free throws for four hours is not going to make you a better free throw shooter necessarily. Well, but if you're doing things like uh, you know you're working on your lay-ins and then maybe you're working on your mid-range shots and then you start working in a few uh, different periods of time where you're working on your free throws and you're doing some some con conditioning and you're doing your free throws after you're doing the conditioning and you're just varying everything. Well, even so, uh, fatigue, mental fatigue, physical fatigue, both begin to take their toll. That's why I don't think it's a good idea for you to have those long workouts. Yeah. Uh, well, break them up. Here's the other thing, too, is yeah. that you don't want to have... 
let's say you have a week's worth of, of workouts, you don't want to jam them all into no, one day. No, 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 no. Well, you would, what works better, it, it would actually be better for you to work out half an hour each day than to work out for, you know, five hours on Sunday. Yeah, right. Um, so if you, if you can get in half an hour every single day, it's better to do that than to have this big giant clump at the end of the week or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because what you do is you're building up your consistency and you're also not going to be hitting those mental and physical fatigue walls. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of a good way to approach that. All right, let's let's start hammering out these questions. We, okay. We're long-winded today. <laughs> um, this is from Isaac B. in the chat. He says, uh, what can make a good shooter a great shooter? Well, practice, practice, practice. In fact, I use that oftentimes in responding to players to similar questions on, online, is that uh, practice, practice, and then practice some more. And that's where you get better. You just spend the time at it. Uh, yeah. Especially if you're using the proper shooting mechanics. And I think a lot of it, too, is the mental aspect of it, where you accept that you're going to miss, yeah. but every time you shoot it, you know you're going to make it. Yeah. Um, so every time down the floor, it's a make until it's not. Yeah. And, and yeah. then, uh, you know, if you miss it, you forgot about it by the time you're down the floor again. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, you move right on. Uh, and that's really true. Uh, you know, confidence in shooting... Uh, is probably the one of the most important things that you you can really be concerned with. Uh, my students, and oftentimes, I'll ask them, "What were you thinking about that ball you missed there? Were you thinking about, oh, oh no, no, I hope it goes in?" Well, that is negative attitude. What you want to think about is it, it's in. It's Michael, down. Michael Jordan never put up a shot that didn't he didn't think was in every single time, yeah. Yeah. Um, because then he he wouldn't have made all the shots that he made because yeah. he would have been thinking about it. Yeah, everything is a make every time. <laughs> Um, okay, this one's from Sean Lewis on uh, Twitter. It was at Sean Lewis 4 He says, could you recommend any drills to improve lateral movements? Well, you know, we have There's a, a ton of them. Yeah, there are. Um, one of the things that we use a lot is a drill that's called step drag. Um, yeah. And it's a good defensive drill uh, for moving your feet. And uh, the step drag is is you're in a good basketball position, your feet in a balanced uh, situation, and you reach out with the foot in the direction you want to go first, and you turn your toe in that direction. And then the other foot slides in. Uh, it comes off the floor a little bit, but it slides in and keeps it low and close to the floor. But you don't allow the feet to come together. There should always be a space in there. There's no up and down of and the body either. No, there isn't. You stay pretty even the whole way across. And you don't want your feet to come up so they're close together. They should be, you know, 18 inches or so apart. Then you step and drag again, and you go the opposite direction. One of the things that we often do, we'll have a person line up uh, with their left foot on the uh, uh, right side of the lane, and then we'll step out into the middle of the lane and drag, step and drag. We'll get to the other side, we're going to bring it back, and just step, drag, step, drag, step, drag. Yeah, and we explain that all in Defense 101, I believe, yeah, too. We do. We do. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, doing stuff like that, um, doing stuff like uh, plant and push V-cuts oh, yeah. up and down the court, Big that's time. really good, Big where time. you're sprinting uh, in one direction for a few steps, you plant your outside foot, and it's almost like you're using that as a pogo to go off in the other direction at another 45 degree angle, run a couple steps, plant that outside foot, and do that. Um, we think that's really important in being able to break down defenders too. It's just be, because it's so abrupt. Yeah, and and con and controlled. I mean, there, there's there's a ton of them. Um, maybe that's something that we can get into. That's actually kind of a good idea. Yeah. Um, but definitely those those V cuts are really good. Doing the step drag is really good. Um, Something that really helps you a lot too is dot drills. Dot drills. Uh, you don't really think about that too much, but dot drills are ladder really drills are good too, and ladder as well. Uh, but and uh, you know, working with the ball too is is probably good. Just mu yeah. multi-directional ball movement and right. things like that. Okay. okay, this one is from Frying Nemo, who is at Sad Listed on Twitter. They say mm -hmm. uh, how to play against big and tall center if you are short. Okay, <laughs> we get this all the time. People are always so worried about their height when they never look at the advantage that they have when they're maybe a smaller guy uh, out there on the court. What happens when you're a smaller guy is you're typically going to be faster, yeah. you're going to be quicker, you're probably going to be able to go to places, uh, eat more easily, uh, you're going to be probably uh, less obvious when you're making movements to some place. 
And then the other thing is that when you're inside and you're going up against these big guys, they are going to be frothing at the mouth because they, they're going to be like, oh, this little guy's in here. I'm just going to swat the crap out of him. But what happens is that you have them mentally if they're in that space. You can get them up in the air with a little tiny pump fake, go up into their body, get some contact, and put the shot up. Um, you just have to use your strengths, which are different than what the tall guy's strengths are, and use that in your advantage and against them. Yeah, now that's the offensive side of the game. Now you look at the defensive side of the game and you're thinking, oh my gosh, that guy's six foot six and I'm six one, and uh, what do I do? How am I going to be, be, be able to be successful? Well, one of the things that, that is really important for you to understand is that you can't allow him to catch the basketball, and you can't allow him to not catch it if you're playing behind him, even siding him. And so one of the things that, that we teach our guys to do is we don't want the ball to get into the middle ever. And so we front them. And one of the ways that we front them is we take and put an arm out um, and, and want to have that kind of on their chest. And then the other hand is extended vertical as high as you can reach. And the thing that you're trying to do there is you do, you do not want them to be able to throw the ball over the top. Um, because if the guy is tall, they can lob it over and maybe they finish. And that requires that you have some help on the back side so that that person can rotate over as well. But that hand vertically tends to discourage a lot of passes over the top. Even though you may not be very big, that discourages it. And we had this discussion in practice the other day. There was one of our guys, and he had his arm down about shoulder uh, height. And uh, we weren't trying to throw it over, but uh, we stopped it. And look, this is what you really need to do is extend that arm up because that visually discourages a pass into that guy. And then the other thing is you don't want to allow him to get close to your body. If he can get in close to your body, he can beat you. And so that's why we like to have that arm bar out in front of us so that we create a space of uh, maybe a couple of feet there that gives you time to react and get to him. Yeah, and if they bring the ball down low, you're all over it. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, is that you have a lower center of gravity than they do, so get it up into their body, and uh, it's going to be tough for them to move around without fouling you. Yeah. So, I mean, there's you need to stop looking at your height as a disadvantage, yeah, even if you're even that. if you're much shorter. It does not matter. Well, I mean, it matters, but probably that you can deal but, with. But it. in a different way, because yeah. you have advantages. Yeah. You're not just uh, you know completely at the mercy of this guy. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, this is from uh, Rolak Michael again. He says, what about dribbling with a tennis ball? Um, okay, here's, here's the thing. I mean, we there's tons of different ways to train. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys that think that dribbling with tennis balls and uh, other objects is a good way to train, and that's fine. We tend to like using the tool that you're actually going to use when you're out there on the court. Um, so using a basketball is kind of what we believe in the most, and, you know, that, that could include using two balls and doing, like, two ball drills and working on, uh, you know, kind of that uh, double ball handling type of stuff that you would see them do with tennis balls and stuff with the basketball. Right. And that's only because it translates better to uh, actual play is, is using the thing that you're going to have in your hands all the time. Um, that's not to say that the tennis ball stuff isn't good because I'm sure that helps as well. We just have a different philosophy on that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. We really like to take and use the things that and the situations that are going to happen in basketball games. Uh, you're not going to be trying to. Uh, cons well, number one, when you're dribbling a tennis ball, that's a whole different program than dribb dribbling a basketball. We like to have people spread their fingers <coughs> and pound the ball hard. That's way more important to me than bound, uh, than using a tennis ball or something else uh, uh, in replace in in place of. Uh, the basketball. So we don't, we're not really crazy about that. Yeah, and you know, the thing is, is that a lot of, of the ball handling and stuff like that and hand-eye coordination things that people try to develop with the, the tennis ball stuff, you can do that with a basketball and you just maybe have to be a little creative about it, but that's how they arrive at using the tennis ball stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but just getting a bath, if you have two basketballs, you can pretty much do anything you need to do to become a great ball handler basketball player. Right. And especially because a lot of the guys that are great players now, they weren't doing the tennis ball stuff. I mean, that's really like a very recent thing. Well, um, you know, here's another thought is that, you know, it's almost impossible when you're dribbling a tennis ball to get your finger pads on the ball. 
you're dribbling that probably with more of the flat of the fingers and even the palm. Well, I think it's mo- I think it's mostly just to build up hand eye coordination yeah, well, and stuff like that. But okay. like, like we say, right. we like the basketball stuff, and that's like what we stick with <laughs> because it's real. Yeah. Um, okay, this is from Premu, who's our who's our guy. He's at Premu22 on Twitter. He says, "What do you have to say about the Trailblazers' technique of aggressively defending the three while allowing middle penetration?" Just another philosophy on how to approach the game. I mean, that's, uh, you know, there's teams that they just let uh, them, uh, the other team bomb threes and, and they block up the middle and they hope to get those uh, those uh, defensive rebounds and and let those guys die by the three. I mean, these guys, they're obviously, they're shutting down the three and they're, they're making it so that it's kind of a, a score-for-score situation when they bring it down the court. Um, you know, it's just yeah. a different philosophy or, or approach. I agree with that. Yeah, it's just what is that one team that has that guy, uh, like the coach? He'll he'll select one key, one kid to be the scorer, and and oh. and uh, he'll take like a hundred shots. Grinnell. Grinnell, yeah. 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 Not our favorite approach, but uh, you know that's one of those those situations where it's kind of a an offbeat approach to offensive uh, and defensive plays, where they just they essentially let the guy cherry pick. And he can shoot. He's the only guy that shoots the entire game. He yeah. gets a hundred shots or whatever it is, yeah. Yeah. and uh, you know they hope to just out outplay the team by having that guy take all the shots. Right. Anyways, okay. Next one. Rolak Michael says, uh, "What about playing in the snow?" <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you don't, that's not going to necessarily make you a better player. Uh, you want to just get in the time in the gym. I mean, people think that adding in all these different conditions and variables and stuff is going to make the difference. What makes you a better basketball player is getting in the actual repetitions of what you want to have happen in the game. Exactly. So dialing in your mechanics, then going out, working on your game speed, game intensity practice, where you have developed those things and you translate those into that, and then going out and getting actual game experience. I mean, putting on snowshoes and dribbling with tennis balls and and putting on blindfolds, that is not going to th- take you to the next level. What takes you to the next level is advancing your skills, putting those into games, game speed, game intensity situations, and then taking it to the game and getting as much experience playing in an actual setting that you actually can. Right? Yep, I agree. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to the chat. This one is from Phobia3004, who says, uh, how to make your team believe in victory before a hard match? You're a coach. How do you, how do you uh, pep talk people? Well, you know, the thing that, that I think is real important when you're going to face somebody you know who's you know, going to be better than you or they're maybe going to give you a whooping is that you want to take and, and just get your players... Uh, motivated to the fact that they're going to play as hard as they can play, and they're not going to be intimidated. One of the things that we played a team the other night that uh, probably was 30 points better than us, uh, and we ended up, you know, uh, got down early, and then we came back, and and they ended up by getting us about, about, I don't know, 12 or 13 points, something like that. But the upshot of it is, is the guys maintain and try to play their game as much as possible and not worry about uh, the other team as much. And then try to get the things done that you really need to do. Uh, you will need to block out for rebounds. You need to attack the basket and get to the line. And one of the one of the rules that our coach has, which I think is really good, is that we want to shoot more free throws than the other team makes. And um, that that ensures us of being uh, maybe being able to keep track of them or keep ahead of them. And he, one of the things that happened, too, is... Uh, we got into the bonus really early in the game because they were doing an awful lot of, an awful lot of uh, uh, arm bars, not arm bars, uh, what's the term I'm thinking about? Hand check. Uh, hand checking. And there, the officials in this area are really t- trying to make an effort to stop that, and so there's, they're not allowing as much contact. They're certainly not allowing hand checking. And uh, so we got into it pretty early in, into the bonus pretty early in the game. Yeah, and you know, for me, I would say letting them know that they have nothing to lose. Yep. It's the other team that has everything to prove. So you send those guys out there, and a lot of times those teams that think they're just going to roll over other teams, they, they have this overconfidence that yeah. ends up sabotaging them. Yeah. Um, and if you go out there and you're just going to play your game, play as hard as you can, and you know the outcome doesn't really matter because you've... 
you, you know, I mean, the, the only thing, the, the worst outcome is that you lose, whatever, that's kind of what you thought was going to happen anyways, but if you go out there and you play hard and you beat those guys, that's, uh, you know, you've gained everything, they're the ones that had everything to lose. Yeah, and from time to time that does happen, you know, the team that thinks they're uh, really very, very strong sometimes comes in with an attitude uh, that, you know, we're just going to take and show up and uh, we'll throw our shoes on the floor, uh, the game will be over and we'll go home. Uh, and those are the teams really I enjoy uh, uh, having a chance to play against because oftentimes they're not prepared mentally uh, for the game. And uh, I, I have a couple of classic stories. I'm not going to waste time on them today, but a couple of classic stories where both the team and the coach that we were playing, um, you know, they were pretty sure they were going to beat the crap out of us. Well, when it came right down to it, uh, you know, uh, the coach started his second string. And we weren't very good. Yeah, and a lot of times when they do that, too, it's like they throw their team out of rhythm. Oh, yeah. And then they have a hard time getting it back. Exactly. And then, you know, they get themselves in a hole, and then they're in real trouble. Yeah. Um, and your so, guys just play as hard as they can. So. Yeah, and you've been in the flow the whole time. So it's never good to go in thinking, oh, man, we're just going to lose. It's yeah. good to go in thinking, we have everything to win here. They are the ones that have to prove themselves. Yeah. Um, okay, so... Let's lightning round some of this because we have a lot of stuff to get through. Uh, so short question or short answers here, but this is uh, from Kadir Wilson in, or Woodson in the uh, on Google Plus who says, uh, "Could you make some videos about getting to the basket over bigger defenders?" I'm watching live, and then he also says, "I'm short. Are there any moves that you could suggest to me to get by bigger defenders?" Yes, go to our videos uh, or go, go to our channel and look up the playlists of all of our offensive moves. All of our dribble attacks. Right. Um, if you if you're if they're playing on you on the perimeter, you can use things like the diamond. You can use uh, the hammer, uh, the jab step. Um, once you get by them, you can use all any any and all of the dribble attacks. Um, long one and one. Long one and one. Um, if you get them inside, you can use the finishes at the rim, uh, where we have I think nine different finishes you can use that out of there. We have we just put up the floater video. You can put check out that video, um, and then you can also work on your post moves. Small smaller guys they can do some major damage when they have two or three solid post moves with counters right. uh, on those bigger guys because those bigger guys they're going to be trying to bite on the block. Yeah. And if you can get them up in the air, they are in big trouble. So that's that's kind of the direction I would uh, point you is check out those videos and playlists. Right. Um, okay. This is from Isaac B., who says, uh, when practicing, does it matter what basketball you use? No, it should just be one that bounces and feels good. Yeah. Um, this is from Awesome Cohen, who says, happy Sunday, coach. Shot science is awesome. Oh, thank you, Awesome. <laughs> um, this is from The Skateboard, who says, uh, what to do in a game when you're the shortest player and you can never shoot because the defense towers on you? All those things that we just said, yeah. you have to get some tools that are kind of in your back pocket, and the best thing to do on any offensive uh, kind of approach is to have two-ish, maybe three moves, and then a counter for at least two of those moves. Okay. So if you're if you're uh, on the perimeter, make sure that you have, let's say, you you have the crossover dribble, and then you have a counter, which is the in and out dribble, yeah. or the hesitation dribble. Right. Um, so you have a solid move, and then these other kind of counter moves that you can use if they adjust to the defense. In the post, you'll have something like... Uh, Spin move to the baseline, jump hook over the middle, uh, and then the up and under. Yeah, like jump hook and up and under are good kind of yeah. complementary moves. Yeah, they really are. So you need to get kind of working on those things. That's really how you defeat those bigger guys. Um, there's Sean asking that quote. We already answered that. Um... Vlasku Angel says, what should I do when I'm against a guy who's taller than me, as fast as me, but much bigger? I mean, he's really massive, and when he tries <laughs> to score, he just pushes into me, and it's really hard to maintain my balance, and there's no point of calling it a charge because nobody will take it seriously. Well, it sounds like you're playing a playground game there, and sometimes it's really hard to do anything about that. Uh, do what uh, you said. Don't let him get the ball. Well, that was my first thought as I was listening to you read that, is he can't play if he doesn't have the basketball. And so work really hard to keep it out of his hands. And you do that typically by fronting him. And uh, you need some help maybe if they start throwing the ball over the top. You need some help from teammates to, to help you defend that. 
Yeah, and we have a question here from uh, Junior Armato, and I'm not really sure what they're asking. If you can send us another question, um, we can really give it a try. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're asking us here. Um, this one is from Luyagu in the chat, He's, who says, does turning your hip to the right work if you're missing your shot to the left? You know, um, <laughs> no. You know, one of the things that you have to remember when you're shooting a basketball is you don't want to turn the body too far one way or the other. But the thing that you want to remember is this. The ball is only going to go where your first two fingers and your arm go. If the ball is missing to the left, that's because your fingers and the hand are going that way. If it's missing to the right, same situation there. And so when we're teaching somebody about shooting, the whole emphasis is on the first two finger, the hand, the arm, everything is going right to the middle of that basket, right to the middle of the nest. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say that. You want to have all of that stuff on your shooting side lined up, a yep. little slight stagger to that side. Yep. If you're missing from one side or the other, that has to do with your release, yeah, usually. Well, it has to do with where your arm and fingers are going yeah. as much as anything. But, you know, one of the things that happens also is sometimes people who are right-handers and they're coming into their shot from the left wing or the right wing, they tend to lag a little bit. Their, their uh, foot that is on the left foot tends to lag behind and you 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 kind of got your shoulder too much to the basket, and that will cause your target to be a little, uh, you'll be offline as well. Just bring that thing around a little bit more, and you're you you be a lot better off. Okay, this one is from uh, just like Rose, who is at B just like Rose on Twitter. They say I'm back again. Ha ha. My question for this week is, what exercises are the best for improving your vertical and ball handling? We have videos on those. Just go to our channel, check out uh, the vertical jump series and the vertical jump handbook. That's the best uh, we can offer on that kind of stuff, and it's really good. Uh, exercises and a program in there. And then for ball handling, we have a, a playlist of those as well. So if you want right. to check out all the ball handling drills, uh, we have a playlist of those on our channel. Um, lots of stuff in there. Um, okay, this one is from Magic Bball 98 who says, what would be a good pregame routine? Does music help? Uh, P.S. Thanks for answering my question. Last week I scored 10 instead of 4 points. All right, all right, great. Okay, when it comes to pregame, it really depends on the person. If you want to listen to music, that's great. I think the most important thing is to warm up and get a shooting rhythm, right? Well, that and the and to get a game rhythm. Oftentimes, players and warm-ups are kind of going through the motions, and, and they don't really get any enthusiasm going. And usually, that carries over <clears throat> into the initial part of the game. So you need to... Uh, have a repertoire, whether it's with music or without, where you're 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 beginning to get the body ready to play and the mind ready to play. And you know, one of the things that I often will uh, tell our guys is, listen, if we don't have a decent warm up, we're probably going to start really cold and not be very effective. Mm -hmm. And so you want to have a good uh, uh, warm up that's going to replicate how you're going to play in the game. And I'm speaking about speed of execution is what I'm talking about. Right. Okay. Um, this one is from Fizz, who says, "How can I improve my dribble?" And then the fish squared says, "Practice." And we agree. <laughs> get the uh, get the practice in. Start using those uh, dribble um, dribble drill videos that we have on there. Right. Um, there's a whole playlist, and you just need to get the repetitions in. That's really how you develop that exactly stuff. Exactly right. Um, this is uh, Jujuan Hendrickson, who says. Uh, what are some ways to improve a jumper? At the time, I, I would shoot a basketball, and it would go in a lot. At other times, it would just miss a lot of shots also. On top of that, some people say my jumper is ugly. Is this a bad thing, or should I switch up the way I shoot? Well, we would encourage you to switch uh, your shooting style so that it replicates something like what we teach. And if you go to our videos, you get an understanding of what that means. Now, uh, we think that most of the things that we teach, most all the things that we teach, are pretty universal. Um, there's a few things that maybe some other people would maybe take a different approach on, but that's important that you do it correctly and then spend an awful lot of time practicing on it. Uh, and, and our big thing, too, is efficiency. Efficiency is really important. Cutting out all the variables. Um, yeah, you know, one of the things that that uh, is a variable that we really dislike quite a lot is the fact that we dip the basketball. We don't want to dip the basketball for one reason. The main reason is it takes too long to get the shot off. It's not efficient. And it's not necessary <laughs> because all you're using it for is to generate rhythm, yeah. which you generate more efficiently by using your feet and footwork yep. and stepping into the shot. Yep. Um, but there's a ton of different stuff. Um, you know, 
that you just want to cut out the different moving parts that you don't need because every time you add in some new variable or moving part, that's just another area for it to go wrong. Um, and so what you need to do is really just focus on cutting down all the, the junk you don't need, making it super efficient. You will have a faster shot. You will have uh, a more effective shot. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just that's the way to work on it. Yeah. Work on that stuff using the form shooting drill, then game speed drills like catch and shoot and catch off the dribble and all that right. stuff. Right. Um, okay, this one is from... A Liger Slayer who says, please help. Every time I shoot the ball at my local rec, I usually make it, but I can never make it in the game. I always get in a hurry uh, when I get wide open shots, and it would uh, it would help my team if I could make shots. And that was kind of part of the other question, too. Yeah. Um, okay, so you make shots in practice, but you don't in games. We have a video on that, and we call it uh, Make and Practice, Missing Games. <laughs> Basic uh, kind of uh, boiled down... Uh, uh, answer for that is that you need to get game speed practice, game intensity practice into your regular schedule. Right. Um, so that means going out and, and taking shots at actual game speed, maybe adding in a defender and kind of replicating what it's like to be in an actual game. Right, and I think we also have one on consistent shooting too, yep. which uh, kind of uh, addresses some of that as well. Yeah, so watch Make and Practice Missing Games and also How to Have a Consistent Shot, I think is what it's called. Okay. Um, this one is from Kristaps Jurgensen, who says, Greetings from Latvia. Uh, how to cross player, not in run, but like you got a ball and you're standing, how to better make moves across up? Well, the one thing I will tell you is that um, crossing people from a standing position probably is not the most effective way to do it. What you want to do is, first of all, is make them move and move them where you want them to go. And and uh, let's say that you're going to use a cross dribble attack or a dribble uh, uh, the words jumped out of my mouth incorrectly there, but if you want to take and beat somebody off the dribble, uh, you first of all need to get them moving in one direction and aggressively moving that direction. And we say, make them defend. And what that means is that you go at them hard, so they have to defend hard. They don't know you're going to execute a move, and so they usually will overrun it just a little bit because they're working so hard to stay in front of you. And when you cross, it's, mu it's going to be much more effective. <clears throat> The other thing that makes that move effective is that the angle of attack that you use. We oftentimes tell our players that we want to take and use an angle that is north-south. That means that we are moving toward the baseline and not move toward the sideline. Because if we move toward the sideline and we get a great move on them, but we go sideline to sideline, they'll be meet, they, they will meet us. They'll be there waiting for us. And so you want to use that angle anytime you're attacking off the dribble. First of all, make them defend, go at them hard and then you're going to cross them up and get that angle toward the basket. Yep, okay, this one is from Paul Ice. He says, is it ever too late to begin playing ba uh, to begin playing because I'm a freshman in high school, 6'1", and I'm really I'm trying to play in high school and if possible college? You're a freshman, that's that's super early. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, you, got, yeah. you got at least four years of, of uh, basketball ahead of you, so go yeah. ahead. Yeah, and, and just start working today. Uh, and try to get better, starting today. American Baller says, I'm back again, ha ha. Oh, he, already, he asked us on Twitter. Uh, let's see. Isaac B. says, do you think there is any exercises mentally to help you deal with contact? Uh, you just have to accept the fact that contact is a positive thing because if you have the ball and you're going up for a shot and they bump you and or hit you at all, it's a foul on them and you get shots. And if you make the basket, you get an and one. Um, so you want there to be contact. Right. One of the things that, that young players often are f afraid of is the fact that contact is going to injure them in some way. You know, of over all of the years that I've been around basketball, I've seen very, very few injuries that are the result of being uh, hit uh, when you're going to the basket. You get knocked down, but usually you get maybe a little uh, floor burn or something like that. But I've never seen anybody... Uh, uh, get hurt super, super bad because of that kind of contact. What, I mean, you shouldn't even think about that. Yeah, you shouldn't think about it. The officials are going to take care of protecting you're, you. In you're that going situation. in there. You want there to be contact. You want that guy to bump you because as soon as he does, you have the advantage. Yep. So want contact. That's all I would say. That You have to have that mental flip switched uh, in your mind that you want it. Um, okay, this one is from Chaos2611 who says... I do two ball handling for like two hours a day. I was wondering if I keep doing it, will my weaker hand be as strong as my strong hand or do I have to work on the weaker hand 
way more to bring it up to the level of my strong hand. Yes, the second part. You definitely have to work more on your weaker side hand to bring Absolutely. it up to your strong hand. I would say that working on two ball drills two hours a day is probably not the best thing to do. No. You want to have, a, like we said earlier, you want to have a varied workout. Yes. Um, do different things. Definitely, if you need to focus on that weaker side, do that. But doing just two ball drills the whole time, that's not the best way to develop no, everything. No, it isn't. Two ball drills are great, but not for two hours. Yeah, not for two hours. And remember this, that, that dribbling a basketball is, is really about one thing and one thing only, and that is controlling the basketball in different situations. That is all it is. And, uh, you know, if you're spending a lot of time on all these two ball drills, well, they're probably helping you some, but... Too yeah. much time on two ball drills. Okay, this is from the Jerkaholics one who says, "What's your favorite dribbling move with a counter?" Uh, I'm thinking that probably um, a flat back. Yeah, you like flat backs. I like flat back, and the one of the reasons I like it is the fact that uh, if it's executed properly, it is almost impossible to stop one on one. There has to be somebody to help you uh, get it stopped if it's executed properly. I like hesitation dribble just because it's yeah. it's so easy and it's that change of speed that it's really hard for the defense to really adjust to. Yeah. Uh, you know because changes in speed and direction are how you beat guys off the dribble, right. and that is one of the just the nastiest and it's really the the easiest. Yeah, it is. Because a lot of it is just body language. Um, Let's see. This is this is on Twitter. This is from just like Rose again, who says, "How do you prevent yourself from being burned out? If you love everything about it, is there still a way to lose interest?" Yeah, I mean, if you're doing the same thing repetitively over and over again, you have to vary it, like we said, and do different things. Maybe go play other guys somewhere else. Um, just have a new scene and keep it fresh. Right. Well, one of the things I think is important too is that by taking uh, time off once in a while is really good for your psyche. Uh, and, and that means getting away from it completely for a day or two and then come back. And uh, Because you can't burn yourself out. No question about that one. Okay, this one is from uh, Alec Vol, or Vole, who says, uh, what kind of pregame slash practice shooting routine to get in rhythm would you suggest? Okay, we have it actually it's something that I suggest everybody that we coach. And that was uh, when you get to the shooting portion of your warm-up, that you have a partner, and the partner is going to be your rebounder, and you're going to be their rebounder. Um, because oftentimes what will happen is you shoot a ball and miss it, and then you go in, you stand around and wait to get another ball, and you take it back out to shoot. And by that time, maybe in a workout you, or a, a warm-up, you may get, maybe get six or eight shots. But if you take a, a partner who rebounds, they rebound and throw it right back to you, uh, and then you shoot and right back to you, right and shoot, you maybe get 10 or 15 shots uh, in the same period of time. And so what, what happens is you take six shots, he takes six, uh, six shots, or her, either way, and, and you start off with yourself at about the, uh, probably the 10-foot line and just trying to dri uh, get the stroke really dialed in, and then the next time you shoot, move back at two or three feet, same thing, move back until finally you're out at the three-point line as you're getting close to the end of that, that shooting period. And by starting short, Usually you get the mechanics working for you pretty well, but when you go out and you start chucking threes right away, oftentimes you're way off the mark and it kind of screws up your whole stroke. Start shorter and work your way out. Yeah, I was going to say the same kind of thing. Worst thing you can do is go out there and just casually be shooting the ball around and you know joking around with your friends and throwing three balls up and stuff like that. Watch somebody like Ray Allen. He is out there. He is dripping in sweat. He is taking game speed shots. He is not just, you know, flipping it up, doing uh, fadeaways and stuff like that. He is going out there and getting legitimate shots up that are going to, to get his kind of uh, rhythm going and his blood going. Well, the other thing is <laughs> I often see guys who are playing the post and they're shooting threes. Yeah. Uh, you know, that doesn't make any sense to me. One of the things I would suggest is you get those guys who are post players uh, and if that's who you are, I, I would suggest you do this. And you work around the basket. Uh, you get rebounds, you put them back. You get rebounds, you mic and step and put them up on the other side. You get uh, balls that you can tip back in. Move out and uh, maybe five or six feet and execute some of your post moves. I mean, this warm-up period for the shots that you're going to use, hopefully, in the game. And, you know, most play, uh, points, post players are not going to be moving out to shoot threes during the course of the game. That's right. Um Okay, so let's uh, let's see here. This is from Premu22, our buddy Premu, who says, uh, you guys are beasts as usual, epic overtime this time, or this round, P.S. Mamba's return. 
<laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, okay, here's the last question. This is from Luyagu, who says, does practicing on a low rim affect your practice? I would personally say it's not the best thing. You always want to try to replicate what you see and what you face in regular uh, games. Um, that said, I mean, you could probably shoot on that and eventually work on uh, translating that back into a regular uh, regulation size hoop. I would say try to get the regulation size hoop. It just makes your life easier. Right, right. And the thing that's really important, I think, is this, is that uh, you usually adapt pretty quickly. And so if you have a rim that you maybe use uh, and it's short, go ahead and use it. And then you'll find that when you move into a situation where you got one this regulation, you adapt to that fairly quickly. Uh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, you start to adapt to it. Yeah, but seriously, yeah. get yourself regulation hoop. You will be yeah. in much better shape. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's uh, going to do it for us today, you guys. Uh, I want to thank you for your questions. If we didn't get to you, it's not because we didn't like you. It's because we ran out of time and there was just so many questions in the chat. Um, just remember that next week we'll be back at 1 p.m. Pacific time on Sunday. Um, we want you to go out there and tell your friends and family to uh, make sure that you uh, spread the word so that we can get more guests on here that you guys want to see. Uh, get some college coaches, some players, some pro players. Um, you know, We've had a few on in the past and we want to bring more of those people to you people that are helping kids get into college, um, a lot of stuff like that. Uh, so make sure you go out there, spread the word. Make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Shot Science. Uh, follow us on Facebook, Google+, we are Shot Science there. Um, and also follow or subscribe to us on YouTube, we are Shot Science there as well. That's where we post all of our videos for you guys. Um, and we will see you next week, right? Great. Sounds great. Thanks for joining us. We really enjoy chatting with you. All right, you guys. See you later. Bye.